Um, so thank you all for being here and welcome. And today we're gonna learn about how our science can be more actionable through connecting with people and communities. Um, we're gonna do that through um, talking about the context of what um, science and society has been and how people are starting to do and think differently. Um, we're gonna learn a little bit about ways people are doing this work already and best practices in community science. And then we're gonna think directions forward collectively, which is gonna be a fun activity that we'll do towards the end. Um, so it's a fun, full 30 minutes, which is now a little bit shorter than that, but we'll make good use of our time. Um, and so to start off, I am thrilled to be able to show you a film that just finished um, being produced this week. This is the first viewing, so you're the first public audience to see it. Um, a little bit of background, so it's part of a centennial grant. James Arnott and Christine Kirchhoff, who are in the room here, raise your hands. We're, we're part of putting together first a survey of AGU members, and then taking and diving a little deeper, doing some interviews with members, and then taking that information and working with a, a professional artist to illustrate what that means. And so, um, again, um, this is the first viewing of it, and I'm super excited. So hopefully the AV works with this, but hold tight. Innovation takes many forms. Ideas that transform how we think about the world, devices that reinvent the way we live, or okay, methods there is that make sound. breakthrough discoveries possible. Second. Conventional wisdom suggests innovation is more likely to emerge when creative thinkers have the maximum freedom to reimagine what is possible. For scientists, this often means chipping away at fundamental questions in relative isolation from the rest of society. It's only later do innovations from this diffuse more widely. Given the amazing accomplishments resulting from this approach, it's easy to appreciate why research cultures often promote an environment where curious and clever people work unconstrained and unburdened from the direct responsibility for solving societal problems. This idea that scientific independence is essential to the process of innovation drives many scientists, funders, and leaders within and outside of science to safeguard intellectual freedoms. But a side effect of this approach can be a form of separation of science from society, which may hinder the ability of science to address some of society's most urgent and complex challenges. When disconnected from scientific processes and results, users of science, like policymakers or community members, are less able to access or even less likely to trust scientific knowledge that could be beneficial. When considering the novel and enormous challenges the 21st century presents, it's imperative more than ever before for science to more meaningfully connect with society and contribute to society's big challenges, while also retaining and ideally enhancing its tremendous innovation generating capacity, as well as the freedom of thought and expression embedded within that. In exploring how to meet this challenge, a different, more interactive and collaborative way of doing science is becoming more widespread. More scientists are now questioning convention and integrating their science with society through collaborations with individuals that have the potential and often necessary expertise needed to generate innovation relevant for societal problem solving. This can include collaboration in identifying questions, determining methods, collecting data, interpreting results, and sharing conclusions. While scientists using this approach are still driven by scientific curiosity and a desire for discovery, they are also motivated to see their science contribute more directly to action and solutions. While more scientists are engaging with society, we still know relatively little about how these alternative ways of doing science compare to more conventional approaches. Nevertheless, 
Early glimpses show how different modes advance both science and practice in new, innovative, and exciting <coughs> ways. Learning more about innovation in this context requires many different kinds of scientists and scholars working together with users, funders, and beneficiaries of science, and asking lots of questions like, what are the types and ranges of innovation in both science and its applications that emerge from research approaches that are more interactive with society? Do different approaches to research yield different kinds of innovation? If so, why? Do different approaches to research and resulting innovations help society better tackle 21st century problems? If so, how? These are big questions. A lot can be learned about changes in how we do science and what spurs innovation by looking at the earth sciences. Communities around us are looking to access and utilize earth science to understand and respond to risks and opportunities. Yet the speed and scale of our ever-changing planet and society requires more and quicker innovation. And innovation not just in technology, but also changes to organizations and institutions. In this process, it's possible that our institution of science, like our planet and society, is presently undergoing potentially seismic changes and reevaluation. If the American Geophysical Union is any indication, more Earth scientists than ever before are doing their research in collaboration with non-researchers who have expertise in what kinds of knowledge is needed, who have a stake in research outcomes, and who can use the science to inform decisions and actions. If you search AGU abstracts throughout the years, you can see a marked increase in scientists connecting geoscience with society. Here are the amount of abstracts that use the terms decision maker and stakeholder, which signifies an increase in partnerships. Here is how many more included actionable and action-oriented which signifies a focus on generating useful information. And here's how many more use the terms co-produce, co-create, co-develop, and co-design, which signifies the importance of working together. From working with ski resorts to study the effects of climate change on snow, to reaching out to water agencies to evaluate the skillfulness of hydrologic models, to helping regulators and restoration professionals anticipate and respond to harmful algal blooms, Opportunities for meaningful interaction with potential users during the research process abound. Thus, the science doesn't occur in isolation, but instead in the world of decision-making, policy, and implementation. There's good reason for hope that more collaborative research will increase the likelihood that outcomes from research are used. Beyond the use of science, there's hope that doing collaborative research will foster different kinds of innovation and ways of thinking. We're starting to learn more from the experiences of earth scientists doing collaborative research more broadly. From a recent survey of over 200 AGU members who have recently led or participated in a collaborative research project that involved users or stakeholders, a vast majority, that's 70% or greater, responded that they're interacting frequently with users and stakeholders of their research on quarterly intervals or more often. They're finding funding for collaborative research Collaborations with non-researchers are helping to develop new scientific questions, and collaborations are changing the ways researchers and collaborators think about problems and solutions. Stories are also emerging from many different types of earth scientists conducting collaborative research. For example, a hydrologist working with water managers to produce new data shared this experience. Quote, we handed off the data to the users, and they came back saying, no, this is no good. We ended up going back, recalibrating everything, and it ended up being a better representation of the hydrology of a region. I think it's a testament to the diversity of eyes, because it's like I'm kind of toiling away on my computer, but there's other people with a totally different perspective. It makes you think about the scientific questions from a different perspective. <coughs> it's just like the peer review process, but like it includes a different set of experiences. These stories highlight how, as one AGU member put it, innovation is like a creative development of something new that people actually can use. Or as another member put it, innovation is being willing to think outside of your expected and established understanding of systems, to be uncomfortable and try new things. As AGU celebrates its centennial, there are now more opportunities than ever before to contribute, discover, learn, and innovate. We'd love for you to come join us. Great.
And a quick plug, we're going to get to learn a bit more about this video, um, and we're bringing the artist in. It's going to be on Thursday at the Celebrate stage in the Centennial Theater. So uh, we have time to think about or talk about the, the results of the survey in more depth and kind of the process of making the film as well. And also, this um, film is something that you all can get access to. We're going to post it. And so you can use it in ways that you think are appropriate too. And so thank you, James. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Ellie. And thank you all who participated. There might have been some folks in here who filled out the survey or, or were featured in the film. So thank you for that. Um, now I'm going to um, transition and welcome Raj up here. And I have great privilege to have him on the stage. He directs the Thriving Earth Exchange within AGU and is going to tell us a little bit more about being at the forefront of this work and kind of some best practices in collaborative science. James, do you want to take that? Thanks. Um, I want to be quick because we have time for interactive activities and it's more interesting than listening to me. I also want to acknowledge my colleagues from the Thriving Earth Exchange, Melissa and Sarah, who are both in the room, um, and Natasha. And the last thing I want to say is that all of the good things I'm going to say were contributed by the work people have done out in the community, and I added the rest to the talk. So this is where we are, old school science. Um, an old way of thinking about science, a traditional way of thinking about science. Scientists, smart scientists, think about interesting questions, they do research, they draw conclusions, then they hand it off through some magical process to communities, decision makers, other people who then apply the results and have impact. What I'd like to suggest and what I want to show you is a vision from the future, a new way of doing science, a way of science that is emerging rapidly and is emerging so rapidly that it's still kind of messy. This involves communities and scientists working together through every stage of the scientific process or the scientific processes, because there is no single way to do science. It means defining questions together that are as much driven by research in the traditional sense as by practical application. It means doing that research together, blending multiple kinds of knowledges, drawing conclusions together, applying results, and then using those results to generate meaningful impact, both in terms of advancing understanding, but also advancing resilience, justice, equity, or advancing sustainability in the earth and space sciences. Um, this way of thinking isn't exactly new. It's got lots of antecedents. It's got lots of history. It's been done in many, many places. And it is really emerging, I think, as a really important aspect of the next 100 years of earth and space science, as we saw in the video. What are some of the characteristics of this way of working? Um, first, it's embedded in action. Um, from the beginning, research it, science is designed to achieve an end. Um, I had the privilege of working with someone named Zuline Mayfield when I was a very young scientist. And I remember going to her and, say, and, and sort of explaining to her that as a scientist, I wasn't going to get involved in political things. It was important that science remain neutral and that, that the work I did was more kind of theoretical. And she sort of looked at me and said, young man, young man, if what you're doing can't be used for something, why do you do it? It was sort of a profound moment. Um, that is what it means to design for action, to be thinking from the beginning about what's the point of doing this work. The second is science is a kind of privilege and a kind of power. Um, it's a way of knowing about the world, but it's also a way of interacting with the world, and it's a way of interacting that comes from a place of privilege. So how can we leverage that privilege to offer opportunities for people who haven't had that privilege? How can we use science to advance community agency? How can we honor community knowledge? This was a project in Ghana um, that looked at meningitis vaccination. And the key inspiration for this project came from people in Ghana who lived with disease every day and understood that the transmission of disease was intimately linked to environmental factors. That became the foundational for a foundation for an entirely new practice of vaccination. It came from local knowledge. 
Um, the, the other piece that I guess I want to say about that is that wasn't even the original intent of the research. The research was actually originally about something completely different, but people in the community said that's the wrong thing to ask, that's the wrong question to care about, this is the right question to care about, and here's how to think about it. Completely reframed the research agenda. Um, you can see in that there's a kind of humility. Um, I think one of the ways that's characteristic of this new way of doing science or this additional way of doing science is it's grounded in profound respect for other ways of knowing. This is a project in the Pamir Mountains of Afghanistan where villagers used climate science to update traditional ecological calendars. What I think is beautiful about this project is science was in service to an older tradition. Um, it wasn't supplanting it. It wasn't verifying it. It was supporting it. And then finally, in all of these um, aspects of things we do in Thriving Earth Exchange, there's a notion that we aren't just working for the sake of humanity, we aren't just working for people, we're working for all of our relatives and with all of our relatives on the planet, which means we're not just looking at engineering solutions, we're looking at natural solutions. This is a project in New Orleans. New Orleans is undergoing a profound transformation in how it thinks about its relationship to the landscape. Traditionally, historically, New Orleans had been pumping water out of the city in an effort to protect the city. That actually exacerbated some of the subsidence that made the city vulnerable. So there's a new, a new way of thinking about water, which is how do we live with water? How do we celebrate water? How do we hold water? And this is an example of what that looks like in practice in a neighborhood um, in New Orleans. The other cool thing about this is this, is in, this was led by a group of neighborhood residents um, who wanted to think about how to beautify their neighborhood, a neighborhood that had traditionally been marginalized in conversations about the future. Um, fundamental idea that I'm asking you to hold on to, I think as Earth scientists, we tend to think about humans as a problem. This it illustrates that. This is a picture by an artist named Chris Jordan. He's a Seattle-based artist who is concerned about making visceral, making visible, making real the impact people are having on the planet. This, is, this looks like a bunch of trees or, or stalks, right? It turns out this is 1 million, 1.4 million paper bags. Does anybody know what that number, 1.4 million paper bags, represents? It's the number of paper bags that are thrown away in the United States every hour. Right? That's a pessimistic view of humanity. That says humanity is a problem, right? But there's another work by the same artist which you don't get to see. Um, but it's really beautiful. Um, and what it is, it's a mandala. And as you walk closer to the mandala, it turns into um, the names of a million different organizations that are devoted to environmental justice or sustainability. And what that picture of humanity is, is a picture of humanity as a million or a billion or 10 billion potential allies in building a better future, a future that's resilient, that's safe, that's just. That's the vision of humanity I'd like us to hold in our hearts and in our minds as scientists. And that is the vision of humanity that I think can underscore a science for the next 100 years. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we're gonna transition to thinking about directions forward. And from the film, we got to see this rise in, in abstracts, there's this energy within AGU of doing this sort of work that connects with um, stakeholders, builds partnerships, co-produces, co-creates, and we want to make a place for it within AGU to talk about it amongst ourselves and also to provide tools to kind of lead when people want to do this. So they do it in a way that follows kind of these best practices. And so now, We're proposing to extend this tutorial, so we don't have enough time now, but we want to have conversations going forward. And so what Raj and I talked about was doing a series of six gatherings, one per month. It'll be virtual, um, but 30 minutes on a project, a tool, a program, and then 30 minutes of an open mic where we can share opportunities, concerns, coordinate efforts, et cetera. And so now what we want to do is we want to get the ideas for what those six conversations should be like. And we want a chance for you guys to also meet each other. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to number off into, we'll do five different groups. 
we have note cards where you can write ideas, but we're also um, going to capture those ideas. Menti, if you haven't used it before, you can pull out your cell phone, go to menti.com, type in that code, and it'll ask you this question. Um, so what topics should we cover, and who should present those topics? So, so we get a sense of, of who we should reach out to have the, that half an hour of time to share tools or resources or programs in, in this space. And then, so before we break up into groups, we'll, we'll do groups. You'll get to talk about it. You can enter it into the Menti. Um, but we'll do a quick report back if there's time of like one or two great ideas that your, your group came up with. Um, in order to know when, uh, well, I'm telling you when these calls are. So we've selected the last Friday of every month at 1 p.m. Eastern time. But also, um, that's my email address. So write me and say, hey, I want to get the invite for these calls. Otherwise, I won't know to send you the contact information. Yep, no, I, I'll do that shortly. So we're going we're gonna to number off and um, by five. So you want to start over here? Two, <laughs> three. OK, so one's over here, two's over here, three's over here, wait, what? Fours and fives up here. And break up uh, into groups and talk about um, what topics we should cover um, and what to present. And then also, uh, this Menti number will stay live for a while, so you can continue to think about this throughout the day. And then also, as you're moving, I'm going to do another. There's a lot of other sessions and activities in this space. If you, This is a schedule. If you haven't yet gotten the schedule, I have a schedule. It also has the contact information about this, these conversations as well. And, and there's a reception tonight with the Thriving Earth Exchange. And so here are some details where you can connect with people doing community science.
All right, it's fantastic to see people talking and I hope you continue to talk, but before we conclude, I would love to hear the top one or two topics that your group thought would be a great thing to present and be sure to pass along to me those topics. So enter it into the code, capture it there, or just come and talk to me directly or email me. Um, but yeah, let's go around group one. Cool. Group two. Oh, um, we only really had time for a little bit. Uh, one of my suggestions that I hear a lot from people is how to start building those relationships. Um, well before you have any money funded, right, which is more of a getting started, well before you have the grant proposal, and how you get um, commitment from both sides of the potential to continue to work towards something together to build mm -hmm. those relationships before you get the Awesome. Awesome. Group three. Awesome, great. Group four. Okay, so what I've heard, and I made really rough notes, was thinking about indigenous communities and engaging them, how to start, how to start building those relationships, um, what kind of engagement and how to address underrepresented, um, finding the voice of communities and centering that, and then um, what sort of support is needed and what's appropriate, is that? So anyway, great ideas. I'm super excited for the next six months. So make sure you can continue to submit ideas, but make sure oops, that you sign up to be a part of it. And it's an experiment. We'll see how it goes. If, if it doesn't go well, we'll reinvent it. So, um, but I think connecting beyond just the fall meeting is super important. And, it does not appear that we have somebody else coming in on top of us, so I would encourage you to have conversations, but I also wanna be aware of your time too. So thank you so much for coming, and yeah, enjoy the rest of AGU, and go to the reception, and come see the film again, and be able to talk to the people who were instrumental in creating that. Okay, evaluating broader impacts, 11.50? Oh, an NSF presentation, so we can make our voices heard, <laughs> possibly. I don't know if they'll do breakout sessions like this, but thanks for being a part of this kind of different way of doing an AGU session, too.